Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. This week on the podcast, we wanted to tackle the idea of attention. How do we pay attention? What do we pay attention to? And we notice that we're living in an attention economy. Attention is really important in early childhood development. It's important in analysis, and it's important in our life. It's important in our relationships. So we're hoping to circumambulate this topic and uh, maybe provide a depth psychological lens to it. I think uh, what is really foremost for me as we settled on this topic is the idea of the attention economy. So sort of paradoxically, my attention is to the external world demands on our attention. A man named Michael Goldhaber uh, wrote about this some, some years ago and how today we live in a world that makes multiple relentless demands on our attention and all kinds of things go on out there to get our attention, whether they're uh, true or not true. And people will pay big, big money for our attention. Mm -hmm. It, It is an economy in the most literal sense. That's essentially what advertising does, is it strives to get our attention, and different kinds of media are getting more sophisticated about how they get and keep our attention. If you've seen that documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma, you can see how much engineering goes on to get and keep or recapture our attention. And in that arena, once the attention is captured, then other directives can be suggested which guide people's spending habits and or their political actions, because what we attend to affects our nervous system and affects our value system and our behavior. One could even say that what we attend to is what we become. And that brings a tremendous focus to whether or not we are attending primarily to outer objects or inner objects. And I think the basis of Jungian psychology is to prefer attention to the inner objects because that's where we are in the interface between the ego and the self. And if we believe that the self is the center of our authentic nature, then it's what rises from the self that's capable of leading us towards a more integrated relationship to the environment versus attending to the economy of, you know, the social media platforms, which actually lead us away from who we are as individuals. 
Yeah, that's that's a great place to take it right off the top, Joseph. And I'm, I have this quote here from Jung that backs up what you're saying. He says, the attention given to the unconscious has the effect of incubation, a brooding over the slow fire needed in the initial stages of the work. Hence, the frequent use of the terms decoctio, digestio, putrefactio, salutio. It is really as if attention warmed the unconscious and activated it, thereby breaking down the barriers that separate it from consciousness. So I believe that this is from uh, Mysterium. And there's a, there's a section in there where he talks about how important it is to pay attention to the unconscious. So this is the mysterious paradox that libido follows attention. So what the ego puts its focus on begins to attract a kind of life force or the image of the thing we are attending to begins to attract libido and life force, which then makes the object seem increasingly more valuable. So if we focus on the unconscious, let's just say dream work as an example of focusing on an image that came from the inside out, the image in the dream begins to mobilize, begins to have greater effect on us as libido circles around it through ego attention. The paradox is that there is a consciousness or a spirit in the unconscious that also makes decisions about where libido is going to be collected. So there's really a dance between these two centers of consciousness and where life force is going to accumulate around images. This really expands what you said just uh, a little before, Joseph, of that we become what we pay attention to, sort of a corollary to you are what you eat. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> Ian McGilchrist in The Master and His Emissary writes extensively <laughs> about attention. And he says, this is just a really short quote, he says, attention, where the world comes into being. Mm. So how we pay attention, what we pay attention to, literally shapes our world. He says further, attention changes what kind of a thing comes into being for us. In that way, it changes the world. And Joseph, I liked what you said about libido. So, you know, the etymology of attention comes from the Latin for to stretch toward. So it's quite literally where we're putting our energy. There's a real connection between attention and psychic energy. What do we put our attention to is the same thing that we invest with psychic energy. And that's so congruent with all different kinds of therapies, People come to marital therapy and they realize they have not been attending to various dynamics in the relationship. Uh, I wasn't attending to your feelings. I wasn't attending to your needs. They had fallen out of consciousness and there was no energy around them in the partnership. The same thing when we work with individual clients, whether they're paying attention to dreams or paying attention to their goals and values. Whatever we pay attention to moves from the background into the foreground, and we can look at it and develop some kind of a relationship. And that has huge implications for how we function as human beings. Circling back, I think what you were saying in the introduction is when outside forces can command our attention, those same principles are in effect. So if as you had mentioned in the movie the or the documentary, The Social Dilemma, that if we're in a self-reinforcing YouTube cycle and our attention hour after hour is being commanded by certain kinds of themes and images that are iteratively repeated over and over again, that it becomes a self-reinforcing world. And as you mentioned, McGilchrist, this thing that I attend to becomes my world, even if it actually is fundamentally absurd and I'm thinking of this movement, the Flat Earthers. Oh, yes. Uh, which a very, very strange eccentricity. But a certain percentage of people seem to have become obsessed with trying to prove 
that the earth is in fact flat and wanting to get a lot of attention on social media and other environments for these uh, efforts that they're making with this pseudoscience. But uh, once you start watching flat earther videos on YouTube, they constantly show up on your YouTube channel. And then all of a sudden you have this perception that the whole world is questioning whether or not the earth is flat. Has that happened to you, Joseph? Have you been on Flat Earth YouTube recently much? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, well, you know, actually, I have been curious about that, too, and I, uh, I watched a documentary about it. And uh, But to bring it back to our topic of attention, all, all of this uh, seems to point to how important it is to pay attention to what you're paying attention to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm also thinking about the uh, the concept uh, that I came across again and again in Gestalt theory, which is figure ground of mm. what is in the foreground and what is in the background. And there are a couple of images that I think are familiar to everybody, such as the image of what can be either an urn or the uh, profiles of two human faces. And it's just black and white. So you can see it either way, but you cannot see it both ways at the same time. We can only, as it turns out, pay attention to one thing at a time. There is, uh, it's a myth about multitasking it's so critical of what's in the foreground. Is it all the YouTube stuff? Is it all kinds of distractions, conspiracy theories, uh, flat earth theories? Or are we paying attention to our relationships, our inner world? It's a choice. Well, we sort of, I don't know, sort of started the episode off maybe with an assumption that, hey, paying attention is good. And we think it is. But mm -hmm. now we've dipped into this place of can the wrong kind of attention or too much attention on the wrong things be negative? And I, I think it absolutely can. I'm thinking about when the connection between attention and mental health, in essence. So if we start to pay obsessive attention to a perceived physical flaw and to begin to ruminate, for example, on I don't know, our nose, believing that our nose is all wrong or it's too big or whatever. And it's all that, you know, when you do this, it's all you can see. You look in the mirror and all you can see is your nose and all of the faults with your nose. And, and then you're really in the territory of rumination. So attention has flipped over into something that's, that's really obsessive and can generate deep, deep unhappiness. And it is possible to, to dial that back and pay attention to other things, pay attention to the wider world, pay attention to other people. That's one of the kind of tried and true techniques for snapping you out of a kind of ruminative cycle is get really interested in another person. So we do have to attend to what we're attending to. And I think also there are some ways when attention becomes ruminative or obsessive to simply change the channel. Oh, just notice, oh my gosh, I'm uh, ruminating or I can't stop thinking about this, worrying about that. Walk around the block, call a friend, uh, make up your grocery list for the week. Uh, because once again, you cannot pay attention to more than one thing at a time. And if while you're, let's say, uh, walking around the block, you find your thoughts drifting back to whatever has uh, grabbed you, uh, just redirect your attention. So I, I think I just want to move this into the realm of the possible, into the realm of choice, and uh, that it's conscious and doable. So the extended story that I will tell clients to illustrate this point is that if you're out taking a walk and a beat up car comes by, pulls over, and there's a kid in the car driving the car with a backwards baseball cap on and a baseball bat in the seat next to him, and he tells you to get in the car, you don't have to get in the car. You know, you, you, when a disturbing thought knocks on your door, you don't have to answer the door. You don't have to go for that ride. 
and uh, <laughs> a client who has issues with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder said, Lisa, thank you very much for that story. But in my mind, the car just circles the block and comes back around. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it, it isn't, it, it sort of isn't always that easy, but, it, but it is important to remember that we can choose not to go for that ride, or at least we can try to choose not to go for that ride. So I'm sitting with this question of how do we rest our attention away from something that has captured it? And I can think of just innumerable therapeutic situations where somebody is having a hard time talking to themselves using common sense, saying, I shouldn't be pursuing this. I shouldn't do this. Uh, I don't want to be thinking about that. And how difficult it is to shift attention. There's this little cognitive behavioral trick which actually can work, which is when an image or a thought comes up that we want to wrest the attention from, mentally we shout the word stop, and then we visualize a huge stop sign in front of us blocking the thought or the image. And then we have a prescribed alternative thought that we're going to force ourselves to ruminate on for a few moments. And there's something very pragmatic about this in terms of our neurology and mastering these habits of attention. We do have to take hold of ourselves when we feel like we're trapped in something in the gravitational field of a thought or an object. You know, I think I want to widen our field of attention here a little bit and go back to pick up on points that you've both made before, which is that there are different kinds of attention. And in the neuropsychological literature, there are five types. They're considered to be vigilance, sustained attention, alertness, focused attention, and divided attention. And, uh, Interestingly, the left hemisphere is responsible only for focused attention. And focused attention is that kind of attention that we have when we're, we're concentrating on a task. We have very narrow, instrumentalized attention that we're trying to get a specific task done or, or concentrate, you know, for example, on reading a textbook that would require a kind of focused attention. It correlates a little bit with something that uh, Jung talked about. He has this essay called Two Kinds of Thinking. And in that, he talks about directed thinking, which I, I think from the way he describes it is something very similar to focused attention. And also a kind of uh, relaxed attention or fantasy thinking is the other kind of thinking that Jung indicates. And that's a little bit more like sustained attention, which also, I think, maps onto something Freud talked about. He talked about evenly suspended attention or hovering attention, and that this is the kind of attention that one brings to, uh, that the analyst brings to the analytic session, that when I'm sitting with someone, ideally, I have this kind of evenly suspended attention, this this sort of sustained attention where I'm receptive without preconceptions, that's part of the nature of sustained attention, is that you're open to whatever appears. Here's McGilchrist talking about these two kinds of attention, if you'll excuse the long quote. He says, what we call our consciousness moves back and forth between these two kinds of attention seamlessly, drawing on each as required, and often very rapidly. For in humans, too, it turns out that hemispheres pay different types of attention to the world, reach out a hand towards it, for that is what the word attention means, the reaching out of a hand, in a different way or with a different set of priorities and values, to grasp and take for our own use, or to forge a connection and explore. The left hemisphere, as in birds and animals, pays the narrow beam, precisely focused attention, which enables us to get and grasp. It is the left hemisphere that controls the right hand with which we grasp something and controls the aspects of language, not all language, 
by virtue of which we say we have grasped the meaning, made it certain and pinned it down. The right hemisphere underwrites sustained attention and vigilance for whatever we may be without preconception. Its attention is not in the service of manipulation, but in the service of connection, exploration, and relation. I feel that that kind of sustained attention is the very heart of a good therapeutic process. And we know when we're being met with that by the other, and it's actually an incredibly rare thing. I mean, when your spouse gets home from work and says, you know, how was your day? And, uh, you know, she's sort of taking her coat off and starting to prepare dinner and, you know, shouting at the kids. She's not really listening when you answer. So that sense of just losing yourself in the other, that other person kind of being the only thing within, within your world for a particular time, we, we just long for that and we know how it feels to receive that and how, how good it feels to receive that. I'm really thinking here about uh, how important the relational aspect of attention is. And uh, c- coming up with this uh, somewhat simplistic and kind of radical idea that maybe when we boil it all down, all we really have to give one another is attention. You know, we, we can gloss it over with something, you know, like devotion, love, care, compassion. But it is our ability to attend. And I'm circling back to the mention of John Gottman, who's uh, extensive and pioneering work with couples, uh, had to do with attention and how you, you've just hit on this again too, Lisa, with, you know, when somebody comes home from work and says, how was your day? Uh, that's a bid. Gottman calls it a bid. A bid for attention. Exactly. And that's exactly it. Of Will you stop what you're doing and pay real attention to me? Um, Certainly in the psychotherapeutic and psychoanalytic processes, we are paying attention to what the person says, what the person's body language is like, what we might uh, hypothesize is going in unconsciously. Uh, we, we're really focused. And in the developmental process, a mother pays attention to her baby. And the data is that that actually is responsible for healthy brain development newborns have to hear the language that they will be speaking, and they uh, shed brain cells that they are not going to need for any particular given language, which is why it's hard for some people to make certain sounds that they didn't grow up with in their native language. Eye contact grows brain development. Proximity and the attention of the mother is the key factor responsible for healthy attachment, meaning growing the emotional centers of the brain in the first two years of life. So I'm kind of coming down to how incredibly basic, important, and central attention is. Yeah, I, there's this book that I love about uh, the neurobiology of attachment and parenting. It's called Brain Based Parenting, and we'll put it in the show notes. But I have a quote from that too that backs up what you're saying, Dev. It says, Children's brains thrive when interacting with adults who have the brain capacity to love them unconditionally, experience joy from being with them, pay close attention to them, and understand them deeply. I wanted to come back to something that you had mentioned before, Deb, which was about eye contact. Because in talking about um, this feeling that someone is really paying attention to us, you know, how do we know? How do we know when someone's really paying attention to us? Some of it is we tell something to someone and the next day they ask about it. It's like, oh, you remembered. But 
But another deeper, more visceral way that we know that we're being attended to is often eye contact. And it's that real sustained contact that you can feel. You can feel when someone's really looking into your eyes and and is completely focused on you, not looking at you and thinking about the eight things they need to do when the conversation's finished, but they're really, really focused on you. And I'm thinking about the significance that the image of eyes often plays in mythology. I'm thinking about the eye of Horus. Or in Greek mythology, there was this giant Argus who had a hundred eyes, and Hera hired him to be the uh, guard of Io, who had been turned into it. Hera had turned Io into a cow because um, Zeus was sleeping with her. Zeus got someone to finally put Argus to sleep, and when the hundredth eye closed, he was killed, and Hera took his eyes and transferred them to the peacock's feathers of the eye being the organ of attention. And and the other thing I, I just wanted to go to, Deb, you were talking so beautifully about the importance of attention in relationships. And the, the, the writer James Salter has this quote that I just love. He says, we live in the attention of others. We turn to it as flowers to the sun. So it does something to the person who is gifting their attention it does something to the one who is receiving the attention. And perhaps in a more simple world where we were not so distracted by so many different things, it was natural for people to find each other the most interesting thing in the environment. Right now we live in a world where there's a lot of attention hijacking. And that's part of this virtual economy that's happened. But Jung was interested in this as well, because in his theory about complexes, these collections of very intense memories that group together and have an autonomous life inside of us, that when a complex is activated, our attention is also hijacked. If we're interviewing for new jobs and we find ourselves constantly angry in the middle of an interview, we realize that our authority complex has been activated. And instead of attending to the rapport with the person who's interviewing us or the details of our resume or investigating whether or not this opportunity is a good fit, we're internally attending to this steamed up feeling that you know, I'm not being treated correctly or somebody is lording something over me or they feel too big and I feel too small. So the attention gets pulled away from what is pivotal, uh, what the significant distinction is in the moment and gets hijacked into the past. I think about this also in a bit of mythology that you had brought up, Lisa, The Eye of Horus is a ubiquitous symbol in Egyptian mythology and artwork and hieroglyphs. And in that story, Set has killed his brother, Osiris, who is the great king that brought Egyptian civilization to its pinnacle. Set tries to take over the kingdom. Isis gives birth to Osiris's child, which is Horus. Horus goes to war with Set, and in the midst of this great battle, Set turns himself into a boar and gouges one or both of Horus's eyes out, uh, mangles them, buries them. Over time, there's different myths where Thoth reconstructs the eyes of Horus, uh, gives one to Osiris, in the underworld so that he can be given some part of this ability to see and attend to things that are above the underworld. Horus retains one of his eyes and is constantly searching and overseeing the kingdom, particularly tending to the dangers of Set. So when I think about the way a complex 
can gouge out the eye, can bring us into a state of blindness as to what reality is or the outer reality is, it also has that archetypal or mythologic dimension to it. So our own internal emotional centers, memories, painful experiences uh, can hijack our attention. And it, it seems to me that we're moving into the relationship uh, within us of uh, what happens in us when, uh, sure, there may be an external world uh, stimulus or difficulty that sets us off into a complex, but that's it's a mistake to consider it an interaction with the external world. How do we bring our attention back to our internal world of what is going on in me? What has set me off? How do I attend to myself? How do I pay attention to what I'm paying attention to? How do I work with my dreams? How do I direct my attention so that it's not constantly getting hijacked or thrown into a complex? And I can be with myself and attending to me as I go through my day. You know, there are defenses against paying attention to ourselves because sometimes what is there to pay attention to is painful. So I'm, I'm thinking about the ways that we kind of defend against really paying deep attention to ourselves. But also what comes up for me is how one of the ways to attend to ourselves and even to our unconscious processes is to really pay deep attention to our bodies and how many of us are cut off from that. And, you know, if you, if you sort of ask, you know, how are you feeling? Like, how do you know when you're hungry? How do you know when you're thirsty? How do you know when you need to go to the bathroom? You know, some of us have gotten really good at not paying attention to those cues it's like they're faint noise in a cacophonous hall, and we have trouble hearing them. So paying attention to subtle feeling, sen feeling sensations in our body that can alert us that we're feeling tired or scared or lonely. Uh, so it, it's work to pay deep attention. I think in addition to the present environment, we had talked about the more subtle events that are happening in that liminal space. Another dimension of attention is noticing the inner objects that rise autonomously when we are holding to an object of interest. And one of the exercises that I'll often have clients do in the office is I'll have them rest in a relaxed way with their eyes open and Pay attention to their peripheral vision, seeing the right and left wall simultaneously, then adding the ceiling and floor simultaneously. And as peripheral vision is sustained, there is a kind of dropping down without going to sleep. At the next moment, we command our interest, but not our visual focus. So if we become interested let's say in the person across the room, while we have a wide attention to the four walls, we're able to track images, feelings, sensations, and memories that rise up in the field that are not overly dominated by visual focus. So it's a kind of reverie mm. that we're having that we still have a focus of curiosity, but we're open to anything that rises up from the ocean, so to speak. Yeah, that, that sounds a lot like that sustained attention. So you're really working on cultivating that. And of course, um, no surprise to any of our listeners, there are dreams. Uh, the parts of ourselves that we know far less well often that rise up to meet us in the night. And can we pay attention to what I often think of as the rest of me or the rest of you, whoever the you is, 
of can we pay attention to that and what it has to say to us and how differently it can see things from the way our waking mind does. Well, and a lot of times on the podcast when we're talking about dreams, I'll often find myself saying something really wants your attention. When you have a repetitive dream, when you have a very frightening dream, when you have a dream that has a big emotional charge, I'm always thinking something's trying to get your attention. And here's a beautiful quote by Michael Mead. He says, paying attention to dreams will often oil the gates between the worlds. And you know, we, we talk about this in our, in our program, Dream School, that, you know, even just writing your dreams down is a kind of attention that we pay to ourselves, to our inner world, and to the unconscious. If all you can do is write your dreams down as often as possible, that's quite a lot because it, it indicates to the unconscious, hey, I'm paying attention. And just like the spouse or the lover across the room, when we pay attention to the unconscious, it lights up and it develops a kind of mutual interest Mm -hmm. in the ego. Yeah. You know, I'm uh, back to John Gottman, who talks about bids and turning. Something asks for our attention, and do we turn toward it, Uh, the other person or our own inner world and what arises every night, several times a night to bid for our attention and we can turn toward it. And you know, a place where this shows up, sort of how do we pay attention? How do we not pay attention to the inner world? It's a very common motif in fairy tales. So, I know, Deb, you have a great example from The Water of Life that, that maybe you want to tell. I'll just tell really quickly the motif from uh, this fairy tale called The Singing Springing Lark. It's a Grimm's tale, and it's basically a Beauty and the Beast variant. And at the end, her lover has been, or her husband, I guess, has been uh, put under spell by an evil sorceress, and she wants to win him back. But he's under spell, and he doesn't recognize her, and so she concocts this scheme to be able to spend a night with him. But the sorceress gives him a sleeping draft each night so that the heroine comes to her husband and he falls asleep. So he isn't able to sustain his attention until the final night when (laughs) when he he able he's able to not drink the sleeping draft and that brings about the the final resolution. So the the answer is to sort of stay awake to something keep paying attention. So this motif of falling asleep just happens again and again and again. And of course, it also happens in the in the story of the Garden of Gethsemane when the disciples aren't able to stay awake with Jesus on his last night. Uh, it's a very common uh, fairy tale motif. And in the Water of Life, which is a complicated <laughs> kind of tale, our hero has to wait a year and then ride up to the castle to uh, claim the inner other, as we would think of it from a Jungian point of view, but the princess. And he does the path all just right. He, he doesn't go too far to the left or the right. And he, he achieves his goal, and he gets inside the castle, and there she is, and <gasps> he falls asleep. Uh, he has 15 minutes to exit the castle, and uh, it seems so surprising. And, you know, after all this, you would fall asleep on the job. And I think these motifs uh, really kind of highlight how powerful forces are in the psyche that distract us, that uh, t- take us off the job that we think we're engaged in and want to do. Maybe we would have to be bigger, and that could be uncomfortable. There is a lot that shows up to take us away from what we want or can or should pay attention to. And that might be a symbolic outpicturing of what Joseph was talking before about 
attention hijacking Mm -hmm. via a complex that we can't stay with ourselves at times. And I think a place that we might aspire to arrive has to do with an idea we've discussed many times on the show, the ego self-access. There's a wonderful claim. This doesn't come from Jungian thought, but actually comes from a, a more mystical background. That when the self is fully activated in the personality, that one's attention is drawn naturally to its appropriate objects. Which is a very simple sentence, but the implications are profound. When that superordinate personality becomes the dominant guiding principle inside of someone's personality, it influences where our desires cultivate. And desire is the thing that draws our attention forward, whether it's desires that are creatively emerging inside of ourselves or outer objects in the environment, friends, family, places that we need to travel to have certain experiences. But when the self is fully activated in the personality, things shift in value around us. And then we find that certain new things become compelling. And and that's an enormous revolution of attention. Yeah, that's really well said. The last bit I might mention from this corner of the mystical world, that there was a not well-known, incredibly productive mystic that was living in rural Virginia, Uh, some years ago, named Walter Russell. He was living on top of a mountain um, in an Italian villa that had been somewhat abandoned on Afton Mountain. It was called Swananoa. And Walter Russell, who was interviewed by Walter Cronkite and uh, who called him the the new da Vinci of, of the modern era, was this unbelievably productive man And he would paint, and he was a philosopher and a writer, as well as a mystic, and he had a school going on up in Swananoa, lots of different things. But one of his observations, and he encouraged his students to really align with this, is that the human soul can only maintain authentic attention for two hours at a time on any one subject. Russell, in a very, very disciplined way, divided his entire day, I think he was productive 16 hours a day, into two-hour increments. He would write for two hours, he would garden for two hours, and he would (laughs) paint for two hours, Mm. then he would meditate for two hours. And these two-hour segments allowed him to create this prolific body of work of arguably high caliber. So that's something I mull over. That's really interesting. I think what we're saying all together, and your example really highlights this, Joseph, is the optimistic point that we can direct our attention. This is altogether possible and and doable. We, you know, don't all have the luxury of dividing our day up into two-hour segments of attention at simply our own choosing. But we can direct our attention, and we can pay attention, um, as I think I'm saying for the third time, to where we pay attention. Uh, So so I'm, I'm liking very much that this is so possible, doable, uh, within our reach, and can make a huge difference. And now I wonder if it would be a good time to turn our attention to a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've 
enjoyed the book and so that feels really great the reviews on amazon have all been glowing and that's been really heartening it's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people i'm just uh so happy for you and it's such a lovely lovely book both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother it's never been that's never been written about it hasn't been out there and that it's getting such an enthusiastic heartfelt reception that's wonderful yeah i would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there um more is always better so thanks in advance for that you've really incarnated something that was in the ethers but needed to be pulled down needed to be shaped in words and needed to be made accessible and the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective <laughs> yes that speaks a lot to the timeliness of this yeah i think you're right too the, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed <laughs> it's having a life of its own which yeah. is just what we want Today's dreamer is a 35-year-old male who is an academic in the UK and his area of specialty is in drama. And here is his dream. A large lesbian woman, Sally, has four adopted sons. Their home is on the top floor of a brick industrial building, like a power station, in the shape of a square with a quad in the middle. They are visited by Kirsty and Phil, hosts of British TV shows about property and home improvement. And the first room they visit floods with seawater as the tide rises and falls, leaving tide marks on the furniture. One of the boys, age nine, insists that the room is not fit for purpose and tugs on the sleeve of the adults. But Sally says it's okay. The other boy runs around like he has ADHD. As they move around the building, Kirsty and Phil discover all kinds of problems. There is an industrial kitchen covered in grease and grime. The roof leaks, and the home isn't warm or protected. In the one habitable room, two boys, one black, one white, are stored in a wall's ice cream freezer. Kirsty and Phil worry that the freezer is on, but they touch it and think it's off. The boys both have their eyes open. Kirsty and Phil realize that their cheerful anything-is-possible attitude won't work this time. They don't sugarcoat things for Sally, telling her that the building is condemned and they need to move. They suggest she sells at a loss. Sally nearly argues with them. She's angry and feels betrayed, but then she comes around. Sally is a life skills coach, and Kirsty and Phil ask her for a session, which she says she will provide for free, but they want to pay her in full. This will allow Sally to recoup her losses and find another property. The nine-year-old boy, anxious, should have been listened to. Here's some context about the dream. I had this dream in February, just after starting psychodynamic therapy. I was brought to therapy by a crisis. My father died a year ago. Then I had a lot of anxiety about a house purchase, which was then replaced with anxieties about my career. Then I got stuck in obsessive rumination and fear. Even though I never felt conflicted about my sexuality, I'm gay and came out at 20, and I thought everything was fine until a year ago. My therapist began linking my experiences now growing up in a homophobic household. I never thought I knew about my sexuality until late teens, but now remember crushes on men from about age 10. The feelings in the dream were that I identified with the nine-year-old boy who was anxious throughout the dream. He accompanied Kirsty and Phil around the building, full of dread and fear that the home was not safe and that the adults would not do the right thing. I was pleased at the end that there was a solution. And he adds, 
I bought my first house with my partner last August, and we had lots of problems when we moved in, including leaks. My obsessive anxiety became attached for a time to concerns about the structural integrity of the building, and I felt like an idiot for having made a mistake in buying the property. The lesbian mother, Sally, looked like a woman I'd seen on a reality TV show, who I somehow perceived to be strong but wounded. One of the first things I notice about this dream is that the dreamer is not in the dream. Mm. So there's a sense of remove, of sort of watching a play. Mm -hmm. So that can indicate a kind of emotional distance from these issues. I also found that interesting that, uh, as far as we know, uh, he doesn't know a lesbian woman named Sally. I, I don't. I don't think that this is a real person in his life, and so it's it's interesting that the dream stipulated that this was a lesbian. And one of the things that I wonder about there is, there's a mother, but there's no father. And the mother is strong, but wounded is the association. So I'm I'm wondering about the quality of the parental complexes, the parental relationships. What was the, what was the relationship with mom? What was their relationship with dad? And then there are these sort of two new parental figures, Kirsty and Phil, who seem surprisingly adequate, actually. Because at first, it's somewhat absurd, a sort of, you know, property home improvement hosts. I'm not familiar with that program, but I can have an imagination about it and that it might be a very overly cheerful yeah i think that because the dream happens inside the home that as you've said lisa we're looking at some kind of a renovation of the home complex and the psychodynamic work undoubtedly that the dreamer is doing is deconstructing the memories of early childhood and the memories of the home and allowing some things to be evaluated perhaps evaluated for renovation. Kirstie and Phil sound like this creative potential Mm -hmm. in the individual. He works in a creative field, being, let's say, a theater professor of some kind. So his creativity and the ability of the creativity to evaluate whether or not something is worth renovating should he go back and dredge something forward because it has value or does he need to yield to the putrefactio that something needs to decay fall apart disassemble in order for him to eventually move forward the dream comes to a nice lysis at the end it's very tidy that there is this agreement among the psychic factors that it's time to leave this It's time to let it just kind of fall apart and to start a new life somewhere else. I'm thinking uh, along some of the same lines as as you are of just, first of all, who's the cast of characters? Uh, So we have a lesbian mother figure, Sally, with four adopted sons. And they live in this odd building, a brick industrial building like a power station in the shape of a square with a quad in the middle. So there are a lot of fours here. And Jung uh, emphasized uh, quaternity over and over again. Four sons, a square building with a square in the center. And yet um, this is a very unstable living situation. Uh, there's there's seawater and there's all kinds of damage. And then what I think about is this one boy, age nine, who's anxious and went around with the Kirstie and Phil figures. At the end, he says that this nine-year-old boy should have been listened to. And I'm linking that to his experience around age 10. When He says he lived in a homophobic household and remembers crushes on men from age 10. You know, so so here's this image of a kind of wise child who sees something that 
only later the other dream figures come to embrace and that it's time to leave the situation. Yeah, there's there's so much, uh, everything both of you have said, and I'm seeing there's these sort of very specific things in the stream, like it's seawater that it floods with. Mm-hmm. So there's an inundation from the ocean. So we might kind of wonder about the, uh, perhaps at the beginning of the psychodynamic work, you know, the sea levels are rising, the unconscious is seeping up and is more accessible in a way that perhaps feels really threatening. And then there's these this image of these two boys, one black and one white, in the freezer. You know, so something's something's been frozen. Some perhaps, and I'd be curious to know how old were the boys, but what's been cut off? And and it's one 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 is black and one is white. So is that is that an image of a kind of compensatory wholeness that's carried by both of them, or a potential for wholeness? That's sort of on ice, as it were. Yeah, I think that's, I have the same feeling, Lisa. And as you said, Deb, the quaternity is really important. The anxious boy and the hyperkinetic boy, the two frozen boys. And I would say that if he could go back into the dream, the mission to recoup the loss and find another property. And I think the recouping of the loss has not been completed yet. So the recouping of the loss, in my thinking, would be to retrieve the four boys and to take them with you. Yeah, and it's so it's so interesting, that quaternity of boys, because there's, there's the anxious one who's somewhat conscious, and then there's the ADHD boy, and then there are the two frozen boys. The frozen boys bring up in me a feeling of sadness, and so I wonder if there might be some feelings of that sadness that have been split off and, and frozen. The the ADHD boy makes me kind of think of the manic defense. And I wonder if this person has a tendency to, you know, overachieve and go very, very quickly to avoid feeling things. He talks about obsessive anxiety, you know, kind of beating himself up and feeling like an idiot. And I'm struck by Kirsty and Phil and the fact that they have a cheerful anything is possible attitude, but yet they are the means by which there is a positive lysis. So I wonder if in a way the dream, if Kirsty and Phil compensate for the dreamer's usual conscious attitude of being um, obsessively anxious, you know, they're sort of the opposite. They're like, any, any, it's all going to be fine. Anything's possible. We can do anything. We're really cheerful. And, and if that's correct, then I think the dream maker might be saying, you know, it might be helpful to put a little more faith in a more positive attitude and to cultivate that. Because somewhat surprisingly, they are the ones who are able to remedy the situation and they have resources they're able to pay this wounded mother her full fee so that she can recoup some of her losses. So that might be an undeveloped kind of positive shadow part of the personality, the Kirsty and Phil mm-hmm. part that's very can do. I am pondering the dream figure of Sally. She's an a- adoptive mother who is also a life skills coach who's living in this absolutely abominable situation. (laughs) Uh, The Kirstie and Phil figures are going to pay her for uh, her fee for life coaching. And I'm I'm kind of sitting here thinking, now, wait a minute. Uh, Would any of us be likely to seek life skills coaching from somebody who's got two boys in a freezer and the roof leaks and seawater is seeping in at the bottom. So sort of like, well, I don't, I I think we might want to have a sort of physician heal thyself attitude here. Uh, And yet the dream says she has something to give. And that may be the, uh, the telos here for the dreamer. Mm. Uh, the two boys in the freezer are okay, the, or seem to be okay. The freezer's not on. They have their eyes open. 
there is an exchange between the helpful figures who know how to do house renovations and Sally, and it appears that they can now all move on. And the dreamer says that he and his partner have also bought a new home, had a lot of problems that may have felt to him like they were disastrous, like this uh, house in the dream. Uh, so, So I'm just thinking about Sally, this family, how very bad the initial situation in the dream was, but help arrived And even though Sally is angry at first, she agrees and is going to be able to move. So the telos is is really very positive. They will move on. Yeah, I think I think that's just right. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.